All right, everyone. Good afternoon. We are now going to start a new a new um, episode of Key to Redemption in Our Hands. We are going for episode seven. Um, Pashas Bahalos Chad Var Malchus. The Rebbe spoke in 1991. Um, this is a fascinating discourse, like all of a fascinating talk, like all of them. And it's interesting that it turns out that this is number seven, because seven is going to be a crucial number in the midst of this talk. So by us, it's also coming out that it's the seventh um, talk. Now, even though we did skip one, we skipped the, uh, the truth is we didn't skip any one that is related to the week, to the Shabbos, but in between uh, number five and number six, there is another talk that is called Taira Chadasha, Kuntar is Taira Chadasha, that the Rebbe gave out, and I didn't have a chance to teach that. Um, we'll have to probably wait until we're done. All these, all of them are the weekly, and then we'll go in back to fill in all those that we were missing. But in the order of the weeks, this is number seven. Now, um, in so the Rebbe starts... So this is this is this is this is great. This is great. You got to fasten your seatbelts for this one. Um, that this week's Torah portion, the third Torah portion in the Book of Numbers, the Book of Bahalosha, stands out from all the Torah portions in the world, and that it is it it it's, the Torah portion straddles three books of the Torah. The part of this Torah portion is in one book. Part of the Torah portion is in another book, a, a second Sefer. And then finally, the third part of the Torah portion of this week is in the third book. And that would make it so unique because every other Torah portion is always in one book. There's no such a thing, a Torah portion that we're reading on one Shabbos that is overlapping two books of the Torah. It's always one book. But over here, sometimes we take out a second Torah and we read a special reading because it's a special Shabbos like um, Zohar or the like, but we're talking about a Torah portion of the week should be more than one book that doesn't exist. And over here, there's three. Now, what do we mean it's three? It's all inside the book of Numbers. Parshas Baalos. However, further investigation, we find out it's not so simple. Talmud and Tractate Masech the Shabbos. We're in for a surprise. On page 116, Dav Kufta Zayin, you can look it up. In the beginning of the first page, the Talmud says a surprising teaching. That is that in the midst of the book of the Numbers, in Parshas Baal in our Torah portion, there is two verses. And those two verses are interesting because you'll look in the Chumash. It is surrounded by two times the letter Nun, known as one of the letters of the Torah, one of the alphabet. And it's an upside down nun. And that is indicating, hey, we got something special over here. That should serve as an alert. That was before the first verse, there is an upside down nun. And after the last verse, there's also an upside down. It's almost like brackets telling you this is this is different. So what is why is that so? So they say it's because these two verses constitute an entire book of Torah. It's an entire book on its own. It's very small. It's only two verses. Which two verses are these? When it speaks about Vahibin Saya Aron, it was when the when the Aron traveled. What Moshe said when the Ark of the Covenant traveled in the desert. So Moshe would make an announcement when they would travel, and then when they would come to rest, Moshe would make another announcement. So these two, and now we say that. You'll be familiar with that because we say it when we take out the Torah portion. That's always what we say. So we actually, when we take out the Torah portions as an intro, whenever we're going to read in the Torah, we we all, the whole congregation says it together. We do that every Shabbos, Mondays, Thursdays. Whenever we're reading in the Torah, we introduce it with this, by reading these two verses. Because we're, the simple reason is because the, our Torah is going to travel from its enclosed Inside the ark, it's going to come out onto the reading uh, table, and it's going to be read from there. So it's traveling. So we read that. 
But the interesting thing is we act, when we're reading it, we're reading an entire book of Torah. Now, to support this idea, the sages want to support this idea that this two verses is considered an entire book unto its own. They, do, they say, well, there's a verse in the Torah itself to support it. It's a, ver, it's a verse coming from Proverbs, from Mishle. Over there it says that Chatzva Amudeha Shiva, that Hashem, God, has excavated its seven pillars. Our seven pillars, which the sages say, what are the seven pillars? Sages say the pillars of the world is the Torah. The Torah is the pillars. Because the Torah holds up the world. And we have seven pillars. What are the seven pillars? The seven books of the Torah. But everybody knows there are only five books of Moses. There's only Chamishe, Chumshe, Torah. The five books of the Torah. Before, not, the, not talking about the prophets. Just the books of the Torah itself is only five. What do you got seven? So the sages say, ah, that's because we have to consider that these two verses constitute a, a, a book on its own. So from seven, so from five, suddenly a six. But it's not six, it's really seven. Because if you take these two verses and make it a book on its own, that means you're also inevitably adding another book. Why? Let's go. Voracious Genesis, Shmos Exodus, Bayikra Leviticus. Then we have Numbers, but Numbers, we can't look at Numbers as the entire book of Numbers. We only look at Numbers from the beginning of Numbers until Balos, until this two-verse book. That's Numbers. That's book number four. Book number five is going to be these two verses. Vayib and Soa is an entire book on its own. That's five. Then the next verse, the latter part of Numbers, we're calling it Numbers, but in truth, it's no more Numbers. It's its own book now. And that becomes book number six. From after Vahib and Soa until the end of the book of Numbers. And then finally, you have the book of Deuteronomy, Devar. So that's number seven. Seven. Seven pillars. So that would mean that Parshas Bahalosha now, based on that, is a very special Torah portion. Number one, it contains within it an entire book, swallowed in it. Thirdly, it itself spans three books. And now we all together, we have a seven book Torah. So we need to understand, we need to understand. Oh, so based on this, the Rebbe is going to ask a few questions. Based on this novel idea, that the book of Numbers contains within it three books. And instead of the conventional wisdom that the Torah has five books, we find out from the Talmud that if we look a little, we examine at, at, at closer observation, we will start, we will find that the Torah has seven books. And based on this, the Rebbe asks three questions. Question number one, he addresses, according to this, the sixth book of the Torah is problematic. What's the sixth book of the Torah? The, the latter part of the book of Numbers. The latter part of Bamidvar. From Bahia Amke is, is the is the sixth book of the Torah. That book seems to be very problematic. Why? Because the opening of it starts with a very negative story. What's the story? The verse says, Bahia Amke The people were complainers. And it relates a story how in the desert the people complained. Rashi says they were complaining because they were upset at the restrictions regarding their sexual um, relationships, their, 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 their ability to get, uh, to find the world today rebelling against it, right? People want to just do whatever their heart desires. And not only do they want to do whatever their heart desires, but they want to impose their, 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 their sick ideas on every on every human being on the world that everybody has to accept this these 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 immoral ways as normality, and anything that uh, doesn't conform with it is is considered uh, is considered that if you're if you're, if you're just a half uh, a decent human being that believes in a god and a creator you 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 who knows what that's sad, but in any case, the the people were complaining they didn't like the fact that they can't engage anymore or they can't marry relatives they can't be in 
an incestual relationship. And that's what they were complaining about. The Torah says that God got very upset and a fire came forth and burnt and caused, you know, burnt a lot, a big size of the part of the camp and many people died. Then it, so that's the first story in the beginning of the sixth book. Then the next story flows right into the people complaining about the month. God was feeding them manna from heaven, this incredible food, nurturing them with angelic food. But the people were frustrated that they're not getting to experience the, the experiences of ordinary food, but rather this is a more sublime type of eating. Although the man was very, very tasty, in the sense that we know what the sages tell us, and it had every taste in the world, depending on what you wanted it to taste, what you imagined in your mind, that's what it tasted like. However, even if you had in mind that it should taste like a pickle, it was lacking the crunch of the pickle. So you can, you can experience a pickle taste, but you know, what's a pickle if it doesn't have a crunch? So what's a, a, a pizza if it doesn't have the cheesy feeling of the cheese coming, right? So you have these various different sensations. And they didn't have that. They had the taste. They had a very nutritious food that was giving them everything they needed, but they wanted the physical pleasures. So they complained. He got the whole story and God sent them birds. They wanted meat and God gave them the birds and they died. It's a devastating story. Follow it up. Let's see what comes next. Next story is a story about another sin, but this time of one of the greatest and the giants of the giants. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses and Aaron, our, our the high priest sister. Miriam, she speaks ill of Moshe. She says, she speaks about Moshe not in the best she has something negative to say about him. And God gets angry at her and he punishes her. And she gets sent out of the camp. She gets leprosy. She becomes a Mitzorah. Tzor she has to be kept outside of the camp. Again, a negative story. And then we move right into the next week's Torah portion, Pasha Shalach, which is going to talk about the great sin of the spies. So immediately the sixth book doesn't get off to a good start. You're going from sin to sin to sin. We are basically crashing. That is the that is the beginning. So the Rebbe says that's no good. Generally, we know all in all of Torah, the beginnings are at least the big. There's, there's always there, there, you know in the beginning of Genesis, it, 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 we also get off to a bad start. We have the sin of the of the tree of knowledge, and then in the various different parts, and then in the book of of of, of Shemos, we have the sin of the golden calf. So we have problems going on throughout the Torah. However, at least the beginning is positive. But over here, we can at least gain our footage. And afterwards, we have to deal with the issue. But over here, we, we can't even get through the first few verses and we're already plummeting and falling. And that's not characteristic of the Torah. So we need to understand, like, how can that be? We have, according to this division, the division of the Torah into six six books, the sixth the, into seven books, the sixth book has a very, very negative um, negative uh, energy to it. Now, so much so, the Rebbe says, that therefore it's the only book that doesn't have a name. The book, the first book of Torah is called Bereshis. The second book of Torah is called Shemos, which literally means names. The third one is called Vayikra, and he called, they call it Leviticus, but in the Hebrew word it's Vayikra, and he called the third one is called Bamidbar in the desert, in the wilderness. The fifth one the, is called Parshas Vayihi Ben Soa. It's called the Parsha of, or Sefer Vayihi Ben Soa. It's the book of, you don't refer to it as book, but in as much as it's a book, it's the book of Vayihi Ben Soa. It was when it traveled. Translated, it was when it was traveled. And the last one, Deuteronomy, is Devarim, which means these are the words. Devarim means words. Fine. But this book, we don't find anywhere the Rebbe says that it's it's named by the first words. What are the first words? It's it's it, it's implied that there's a sixth book, but no one gives a name to it. What and, because, and it makes sense why there's no name because the name <laughs> it would be carrying a very very dark name. What are the words that are usually the name of a book is always picked from the first words. Over here, the first three words the Rebbe says are all terrible. <laughs> the word the first word is vayihi. Vayihi, the sages say, whenever you see the word Vayihi, you know, you know trouble is on the way. 
they say the word, the sages detected this. Every time it says, Vahaya, like Vahaya im Shamoa, it will be when you will listen. That's good news. Vahoa, Vahaya says, it's good. But when you are, see the word Vayihi, you know upcoming travel. It's like on your GPS, where you can see the red, you know, it starts getting yellow and red or orange. They say, oh my, this means we're going to be sitting in traffic. When you see the word Vayihi in the Torah, Vayihi means pain. And the sages always talk about it. Whenever you get the words, they ask, what's the pain? What's the, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. It's trouble ahead. So the first word over here in the sixth book is Vayihi, which is not good. The next word is Ha'am, the people. Now the Jewish people usually in the desert are called B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. Sometimes they're called the people. The sages, however, say in the Midrash that whenever it says the people, it means the wicked. Vayihi, it is trouble. Uh, um, the people, which are the wicked. And finally, uh, um, and the third word is kimisoninim. Misoninim means complainers. And complaining is not good. The word kimisoninim means like complainers. Complaining is not good. And especially when God does for you so much good and miracles and all we can God forbid reciprocate with reciprocate with is with complaining that be that's being ungrateful. So that's 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 and that's actually the name of the sin. Whenever we want to refer to this particular incident, we refer to them as the misoinanim, the complainers. So like he is not good, um is not good, the com and the complainers is not good. And if you want to choose, you want to try maybe a luck with the next word. The next word is worse than all of them. The word is ra. Ra means bad. The people were misowning him. They were complaining, ra, bad in the eyes of God. So no good. You don't have anything to grab onto that's positive over here. So therefore, it doesn't have a name. But that makes it even more shocking. How can there be a book without a name in the Torah? And the reason, and we understand why there is no name, because it's negative. That means the Torah has such a negative, seems to have such a negative Torah portion. Not just Torah portion, Torah book. Um, the Rebbe adds to complain is actually contradicting what the Torah tells us the Torah tells us that even when you encounter something difficult in life you're supposed to thank God on the difficulties on the hardships in the same way like you thank God for the good not the, not, not complain okay that, so that's question number one it's all one question the idea is the sixth book seems to be negative and it's so negative that it doesn't even have a name or we're afraid to name it. We get to, and that's hard to say that on a book of Torah. Torah is the biggest blessing. How can you have a, How can I have such negativity? Second, in the Rebbe is asking, if you ask a child or you ask anybody in the world, how many those who know anything about the Bible, how many books are there in the Bible, in the Chumash, at least in the in the Torah, you say five. And that is even according to Torah, there are five books of Moses. But yet now we find out there are seven, which means both are true. There are five and there are seven. Depends if you how you divide it. If you look at the whole book of Bamidbar as five, it's five. And if you split it into, if you look at the whole book of Bamidbar as one, I'm sorry, then altogether you have five. If you look at the book of Bamidbar as three, you end up with seven. So the Rebbe asks, what's the idea behind it? Why is the very same Torah a Torah of five and a Torah of seven? He's not asking which one is it. He's asking what's the content of it having two dimensions. We understand that now the Torah has two dimensions. A, di a dimension of Torah where the Torah is on the level of five and a dimension of Torah where the Torah is on the level of seven. So what is the content of the Torah of five versus the Torah of seven? Question number three. Question number three is more of an inquiry than more than a, a challenge. The question is, what's the relationship of this with the Torah portion of Baha'u'llah? Why, if you're going to have a one Torah portion, which is going to reflect three books, why is that division taking place out of all partios? Why is it happening in the book of Baha'u'llah? So the Rebbe suggests an answer. He says, you know what? It's pretty obvious. Because what's the first 
mitzvah, the opening discussion in the book of Baalos, in the, in the Parsha of Baalos, huh? it talks about kindling the menorah. How many lamps are there in the menorah? Seven lamps. In that sense, we can say the menorah, which is a candelabra, which a candelabra means it produces light, is the Torah. Because the Torah is here to bring light to the world. And just like the menorah had seven lamps, so too in Parshas Baaloscha we find out that the Torah also has seven books. So the seven books are now corresponding to the seven lamps of the menorah. That's why in the Torah portion that talks about the seven lamps, that's where we divide the Torah into seven. So that is that would be a, that would make sense. But we need to understand, however, how does this fit again with the division of the Torah into five? In other words, the Rebbe really answered the third question already, the relationship to Baal but he's still going back. So good, I, under, I get that. But like, so, but, but what is the content here? We're going back to question number two. What is the, what is the content over here? How, is the, how does this fit with the ordinary division of the Torah into five. So to understand all of this, he says, let's get a little deeper into Baha'u'llah. We got to first understand, every Torah portion has its character, has its essence, has its core. Let's open up the, 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 the Torah portion of Baha'u'llah and see what, what's at the heart of this Torah portion. And then we'll be able to understand everything. Now the Rebbe, which is so marvelous about him, even though he gives us the most genius, 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 deepest explanations, he always makes it so simple. He always says, listen, says, we got to first start with the beginning of the Torah portion and how it is understood and read on the most simplest of levels. And when we say simplest of levels, we mean both its content, what does it mean on a simple level, and what is it teaching us, the most simplistic, basic teaching that we get out of it. Because Torah is supposed to be an instructor for life. Torah, we're not just learning out of curiosity and for intellectual stimulation. But when we're learning Torah, it's because we want to improve our lives and live our lives in the godly way. And the Torah is instructing us on how to live our life in, in conjunction with God's intention of, of all of us. And therefore, every part of Torah is supposed to teach us something. Definitely, the part that's talking about the divine, the, 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 the temple service, because the temple service is, is really what we're all about. We're all meant to work in the temple. We're not all meant to work in the temple in Jerusalem, but we're all meant to work in our own temple because everybody's heart is a temple. And God really says, I want to dwell in your heart. Make your heart a sanctuary for me. And in that sanctuary that we have, we need to do the service, including lighting the menorah. So we need to understand it on a very personal level. What does it mean? What is the Torah portion teaching us to light our menorah? Now, we can explain it mystically, Kabbalistically on the deepest esoteric levels. Or the Rebbe says we can explain it on a level that is understood for little children, for everybody. And that's the way the Rebbe says, I want to explain this. Because first, we always have to start with the most simplest interpretation as it applies on the, on, the, on the literal level. And the Rebbe, by the way, says, even though the Torah could be understood on four general planes, and each one of these four general planes has 600,000 interpretations, like I discussed in the class before this. There's a class before this that I just gave about an hour and a half ago called um, Mind Expansion. Um, over there, we discussed this idea, and I mentioned this teaching. But over there... Um, it says that the Torah has 600,000 interpretations in the simple level, 600,000 interpretations on a more, on, on a more uh, code level, 600,000. There's, there's four levels of Torah, and each one has 600,000 interpretations. But in the, in the footnote 20, the Rebbe says that each one of those 600,000 gets then subdivided into 600,000. So based on that, they're not, there aren't four times 600,000, which would make it 2,400,000 interpretations in every verse. There is, I, I, I did the math yesterday on my uh, phone, I think it came out to 1 trillion 422 million interpretations in every word of Torah. Based on that, 
we can understand that we can take this in all directions. But the Rebbe says, notwithstanding the Torah being so rich and so great, let's stick to the most simplest of simplest. Let's not get fancy schmancy over here. Let's just proceed on the most simplest of levels and read it like you're reading, you're learning it when you're three or five years old, six years old, you're studying. What does it say? God is telling Aaron, the Kohen, that he should go, when he goes into the temple, okay, and that he should light the menorah, and it's telling him exactly how he should light it. So one of the instructions regarding the lighting of the menorah is as follows. When you will light the menorah. It's giving instructions that they should all shine towards the middle. You should tilt them in a way that they should all turn to the middle. But Rashi is perturbed by the words when you will. doesn't say when you will light it. The, the, the proper word for lighting should be kishetid lok. When you will light, like we say, lahadlik near Hanukkah. When we light our Hanukkah lamps, we say lahadlik. Or when women light their Shabbos lamps, they say lahadlik near shal Shabbos or Shabbos. We, uh, but here it doesn't say kishetadlik. It says bahaloscha. Now, what does the word bahaloscha mean? It comes from the word aliyah. Aliyah means to elevate. Like when people go to Israel, they're called making aliyah because you're going on to a holier, a holier place. It's called being elevated. Balos chesaneros means when you elevate the lamps. So why is it? Why are we using such a such a such a unusual term when you elevate the lamps? So the simple answer is because when you light a candle, what happens? It, it rises. The lamps rise. But Rashi adds to it, and he says that when the Kohen has to know. So by the way, Rashi is one interpretation, which is the Rebbe doesn't talk about over here, is that. There were, there were steps in front of the menorah. There were three steps. So when the Kohen went to light the menorah, he would walk up these three steps. So that's why it says, because you have to, it's not the lamps that are being elevated. The Kohen himself has to be elevated to be able to light the menorah. But then Rashi gives, or his, I think this is his first interpretation, Rashi says, is that this is instruction for the Kohen. That when you are, whenever we, Put whenever we light something, a candle, a lamp, there is the action of taking a, an existing fire and applying the existing fire to this uh, wick that at this moment doesn't have fire. So there is a moment where the two wicks meet. Like, right? think about it taking a, a candle and lighting another candle. There is a moment where the two weak wicks are meeting, not necessarily maybe they're touching or they're not touching, but the same fire is encircling both wicks, okay? The wick that's burning and the other one. At that moment, that, that lamp, the second lamp is also burning. However, if you pull back your igniting uh, candle, your igniting wick very quickly, then the fire will not remain because that other candle has not really caught on yet with the fire. Technically, if you're telling me to, to light a candle, I lit and maybe I can pull away, and even if it goes out, I'm okay, because I lit it. I fulfilled the obligation. So from here we're learning, no, no, no. The Kohen has to keep the fire on top of that new candle that is now going to be lit on that new lamp until it catches on that it can burn on its own. And then the Kohen can leave, pull his wick his lamp away, and light the other ones and eventually go away from the menorah, no one is going to be in the temple like it was every evening. No one was there all night. And it burned all night long till the morning. And it's burning from where? From within itself. So that's what it is learned out from the words, Bahaloscha. Aloscha means elevated to the point where it's now already burning on its own. You, you did not fulfill your mitzvah by just extending fire to a lamp if the, if the wick and the lamp has not has not um, grabbed hold to this fire that it, if it doesn't own it, if the lamp itself doesn't own it, but you are the one giving it its fire, even if it takes you sometimes, if the lamp is stubborn, could be you're standing there for 35 seconds. So you're saying, I'm there already a while, I'm burning for a while. No. If you know that if you're going to pull your hand away, it's, it, 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 the, this own lamp has not owned the fire yet has not assimilated it into itself, that it's burning on its own, then 
you didn't fulfill your mitzvah. You got to wait there until it is self-sufficient. You can leave and it is burnt. That is the, learn, the teaching, the simple meaning, halachic criteria of the mitzvah to the Kohen that we learn out from these words, bahaloscha esaneros, when you, la- when you light the lamps. And the main word, bahaloscha, which is the name of the parsha, elevate it that it can burn on its own. So the Rebbe says, wow, now we're going to watch this. This is such depth that it's going to come out of just this one simple teaching. He says, wow, this is a teaching of, of what our purpose in our lives are to each and every one of us. This one teaching can serve as a major, major guidance and a major, a major teaching in every single one of us in our lives. First of all, we need to know that our business is to light a lamp. That's our business. In a sense, we can take a look at everything we do in this world from the day we're born till, God forbid, the day we leave this world. The entire business of life is to light up a lamp. What's lighting up the lamp? The world is dark. Why is the world dark? Even though it's a nice sunny day, the world is dark because God is hidden in the world. Hashem is concealed. Hashem is hidden. The world feels and seems like a godless place. Your job is to, to create light. And what's the light that everybody can see what's going on? And that's the light. And, what, and what's going on is that God is the creator of the universe. He's the creator of the universe. He makes the universe. He purposely made it dark, but he wants us to light it up. What are we going to use to light up the world? We will, we will use our lamp. The lamp that's inside of us is our soul. The soul is called the lamp. Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam. The soul is a perfect lamp. When we say the soul is a perfect lamp, means that the soul has whatever it needs to burn, to burn and give light. What's its, what does that mean? Just like a lamp needs to have a cup. And the cup, I'm talking about the old lantern, right? It had a cup, it has a oil, it has a wick. Those are the components. And then sometimes you need something to hold the cup if you want to put it down on a, on like a menorah, on a, on a lantern. Fine. That's what is needed. Our soul is perfect. It is ignitable. It has oil. It has a wick. It has whatever it needs. But now, what does it mean to light it up? It means to actually put the fire on, that it should burn. What's the fire? How do we make our soul give godly light? The fire is Torah and mitzvot. When we learn Torah ourselves, we light up our in, our inner consciousness. We become full of awareness of God. The Torah teaches us about God. Then when we share that Torah with others, then we're lighting up the people around us. We're making them aware of God. If you're sharing Torah on YouTube, on, on Facebook, and you're getting out there into the world, you're a lamp. The lamp is lighting up many lives. It's important to know that everybody should share. That's why you, you know information. Share with others. Teach, teach. It's very important to, sh- to send our lights out, to light up the world. It's not only with Torah, a mitzvah. When you're doing a mitzvah, you're bringing, you're infusing godly consciousness into the world. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't see it yet. But the consciousness is coming into the world. The world is changing as a result of Torah and mitzvahs. So again, the lamp, the, the lighting of the lamp is our soul is a lamp. The fire, a Torah mitzvah is called, is, is the fire on that lamp. Like it says, kiner mitzvah v'torah, or mitzvah and Torah, mitzvah is a lamp and Torah is the light. The Rebbe is now fusing both these lamps, the soul and Torah mitzvah, because you need to have a soul in order to do Torah mitzvah, to learn Torah and to do a mitzvah, you need a soul. So now, but you combine the soul with a mitzvah, then you are now making fire, you're making a light, which that light lights up the world. And our responsibility in making that light is number one, to light up ourselves, our own bodies, our own lives. God forbid a person can live a godless existence and it's a dark life. And a person can live a life full of godly consciousness and it's a bright light. In addition to lighting up our own self, it's our responsibility to light up the people around us. And eventually to light up farther and farther until we light up the whole world. Both individually and collectively, we light up the world. So now there is a very important teaching. 
which there is a very important teaching, and that is that how are we supposed to do this work of lighting? Now, by the way, I just want to mention, because the Rebbe is going to make a strong emphasis on this, that it's not only this light, this flame, this igniting of the light, that we should live in light, not in darkness, is not only when we're learning Torah doing mitzvos, because that's not possible to do that 24-7, because there are moments in our life that we have to care for our body, and we have to be doing something material and physical. We eat, we sleep, we exercise, we go out and make a living, and it's not always directly engaging in a mitzvah, or Torah study. We have to set times to study Torah. We have daily mitzvot, but we can't be expected every second because we need to live. But however, the Rebbe says, that too has to be ignited with light. Because when we have the right intentions, when we are doing our, going about our daily activity, even what we might look as mundane activity, if we do them in a mindful way, and we're aware of the purpose and the mission of why we're doing them, we're not just doing them because we, of survival. We're not just doing them just out of a, a desire for pleasure or whatever it is, but we do them with a mindfulness that we want to serve God, then even all those activities are part of the lamp, part of the, of the illumination, because we are illuminating all the time. And through the illumination, as we carry that into our own activities, the world itself, the means, the actual world outside of us, starts to become luminous. How luminous does the world come? The Rebbe says the world becomes, the entire cosmos becomes a candelabra for God, a glowing light. The world becomes a display of divinity. And that's what we say is the ultimate objective. God wants to have a home in this world. Just like on the menorah, you have these godly flames burning, a godly light. The same is also the entire world becomes a menorah where the divine dwells upon so that's the ultimate objective. We have to light up the world with Torah and Mitzvah. But here is where we get the instructions of the, when it says, ba, this, we, this, this, every, this is a common idea. I mean, the way the Rebbe says it is so beautiful. He puts it down so simple. This is the job of all of us. Every single one needs to do this. We have to, every single one has a portion in the world that we can illuminate. And only us, it's waiting for your mitzvah. It's waiting for your teaching, for your inspiration. Fine. But here is where, the, where, where it starts getting very specific, where he says, listen here, the, the Torah is giving you here instructions that how you should do this. You need to do it in a way until whatever is the, the lamps are burning on their own, they shouldn't need the assistance of the igniter, of the lighter. So what does that mean? And our, just like with the Kohen, with the lamps, you have to stand there and make sure, affect it until it's, until it's burning on its own. So what does that mean? It says, that means like this. Initially, the, the igniter of all lamps, of all spirituality and holiness in this world is God. Number one, he's the one who gave us a soul. He's the one who gives us this higher consciousness, this higher being. So God is the one who's illuminating. He's the one giving, he's igniting. Then in addition to that, and he gives us the Torah. So he gives us the Torah, he gives us the fire, he gives us the soul. And in a sense, he lights up our soul with his light. Divine assistance. In addition to that, there is in every generation, God puts a great leader of the generation, a great rabbi, a great saintly man. And there's a super tzaddik. And his job is to light up all the souls. There is many tzaddikim, many righteous people who light up small communities and some other have influence on even larger communities. Then there is the one leader of the generation that lights up all the souls of the generation. Our generation, of course, is the Rebbe. He sent out his emissaries across the entire world to find all the Jews and light their souls up, teach them and inspire them to do mitzvahs. So the job of lighting up the world so even though initially we need to receive the assistance from God, we need to uh, receive the assistance from the great shepherding soul that shepherds all of our soul with light, like Moshe and his generation, King David and his generation, 
and so on and so forth throughout all the Baal Shem Tov and his generation, the Rebbe and our generation. And then in addition to that, everybody has private teachers and mentors. We all have private teachers and mentors, which these teachers and mentors in our own lives teach us, instruct us, whoever that teacher is, whether it's a teacher that from beginning with one's parents, if, if we are fortunate that we have good parents who, who teach us in the right path, and if we had teachers in school, mentors, or whether we were these teachers came to us in our lives, we merited to go to a good school with a good teacher who brought us, who, 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 or we have to find these teachers on our own. Today, you can search the internet and find good teachers. You find teachers that inspire you, that enlighten you. So this is all great, but that's not the ultimate. The ultimate state is not that we should have to continuously rely on inspiration coming and enlightenment coming from outside of us. But rather, we need to reach a point where we are standing on our own feet when we're self-sufficient and when the fire and the light is owned by us. It's coming from within ourselves. We shouldn't need continuously to go elsewhere. We should have an inner fountain of wisdom flowing from within ourselves and not have to continuously be leaning on others. And that's God's desire. God wants you to stand on your own two feet. Not that we shouldn't continue to learn and be inspired. We should continue. We should learn and get from other people and grow. But whatever we do get, it shouldn't be that the moment my teacher or my inspiration leaves me, I'm in the dark and I collapse. But I can go. I have a, I have a, I have a full tank. And I can go on my own. I can fly on my own. I can spread my wings and connect to God with my own mind, with my own intelligence, because I've absorbed so much Torah knowledge that I'm able to innovate in Torah from within myself. And I'm able to be inspired by a mitzvah from within myself. That's the idea. Now the Rebbe breaks it down. Phenomenal idea. Now, the Rebbe breaks it down in, in every word that Rashi uses. It breaks it down into small change. Rashi uses three words to explain this idea. That why it says bahaloscha, which means it should be when you will elevate the lamps, when you will bring up the lamps. Rashi says three words, shalheves, a flame, ole rises, may allow on its own. So how, look at the depth that the Rebbe teaches in these words. Shalheves, he says, number one, God gave you the what? He ga God gave you the, the, hard, the hardware. He gave you the lamp in the, in the sense that he gave you the soul. He gave you the capacity. Gave you a, gave you a lamp. Gave you a wick. Gave you an oil. Gives, gave you oil. However, our job is to create the fire. To ignite it. To get, to get a fire. Now, the word Rashi is using for a fire is he's using the word shalheves, which means a flame. But the word shalheves usually means a flame. It means a big flame. So, Number one is when we're talking about being a light into the world, a light onto the nations and a light onto our surroundings and a light to ourselves, our soul should be ignited with godly light. Number one, don't be happy with a little light. Make sure it's a bright light. A whole lot of light is shining. That's number one. Second word is ole. Ole means it's rising. But the Rebbe learns more than just the regular meaning in it. He says it's teaching you that in our quest and our growth and our fulfillment and our purpose in life to illuminate and to shine, we can never, ever remain on the same level. There is a constant calling for more and more and more and more and more. If we're stagnating and we're staying in one place, we reached a certain level, we learned already, I know already, and I kind of accomplished already, I'm good, I'm aware of God, I'm aware of holiness, I'm, I, I've attained a certain connection, I'm good. That's not it. Ola, Ola means continuously rising. And the Rebbe points out that the word Ola, which means to rise, is more, it's deaf, it's, 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 it's even a greater novelty than what we say walking. Generally, we say a person has to always be moving as opposed to standing in one place. The angels are called stationary beings. They're created with a certain spiritual capacity, very lofty, very powerful, but they can't expand. They're fixed and they're on their place. 
souls have the ability to move. But the Rebbe says, which means like a, a, a mobile being who can move from, le- from place to place. However, the Rebbe says, in moving, there is moving where you're moving in the same, on the same level, you're just expanding. So you're walking, in the, you're walking uh, north, east, south, and west. The word O complete different zones. It's not within your level, you're just expanding. And was, our growth in our life has to constantly be that I'm, I'm searching always for something deeper, for more. I want to break out of where I am and move to a whole new level. And that's how God create. That's what God wants of us. Every single one of us. We should light ourselves up with godly inspiration, with godly enlightenment. But since God's godly light and Hashem is infinite and boundless, so this this connection to Him and the and the and the illumination that we illuminate from this connection to our surroundings and to the dark into the dark world to illuminate it has to be brighter and higher and higher and higher and higher without an end. That's what's learned out again. So number one, don't suffice with a little fire. Number two, make sure that even if you have a bright fire today, your your tomorrow's fire should be much higher and much brighter. And the next day, even higher than that. And thirdly, that all of this should become natural to you. Me'eleho, that's the third word. It starts becoming organic. It starts becoming integrated into who you are and what you are, that we become so identified with this growth pattern and with this development that we're moving and we're increasing that a day that we're not doing that, we feel kind of sick because we're, we're, not, we're not in the motion, which it becomes natural to us. That's the point. It's not like there should be someone outside of us pushing us, grow, move, move, move. It should become organically ingrained in each and every one of us that we're we're seeking more. We're seekers. We become seekers from within ourselves. Without outside assistance, become a, a, a inherently we're moving. Now for this, the Rebbe says, we need to have to be in this state now, in order for a fire to burn like that, you want to make sure you have a good quality oil, you have a good quality lamp, <laughs> and you have a good wick. Because the Talmud in, in Tractate Shabbos says that regarding lighting Shabbos candles, it's very important that you that, that that there are certain laws and restrictions, certain lamps and certain are not kosher for Shabbos candles. It means you're, it's and you because the oil is not a good oil and the, and the wick is not a good wick, there are certain limitations. So the quality of the wick, if it's a very good wick, cotton wick, the quality of the of the oil, it's a very clean oil. Olive oil is considered a really good oil. And then the quality of the, of the whole candelabra, the whole situation helps and makes that this is the type of fire you're going to get. So therefore, and that takes sometimes work. Sometimes we got to work. For example, when we are treat ourselves to indulgences of the physical material world. We want to reach spiritual heights. We really want to grow, but we're having a hard time letting go of the physical pleasures and delights in, in the physical world. We want to hope because, you know, and we think it won't bother us. The fact that I can be so attached to the material pleasures is not going to hinder. Not exactly. Because it's going to hinder the quality of the land. So we have to make sacrifices. It requires sacrifices. It requires to be removed from the from the coarseness of life, to dedicate ourselves to spiritual pursuits. And, and through our bending and yielding ourselves to God's will, even when we're uncomfortable, even when we don't want, through pushing ourselves more, even at, all that creates a refined vessel. When we have a refined vessel, then when we introduce spirituality, we study and we learn, we will find that we create a very bright fire. We'll also find that we're motivated to grow. We won't feel the weight. We won't feel the laziness. We'll feel the the energy and the excitement, the curiosity, the spiritual curiosity that will propel us further and higher and higher and create this this momentum of continuous growth. Now... The Rebbe says,
this service in chapter five, Rebbe now says that, that this service of Shalheves, of the lamp rising on its own, this needs to be in all aspects of our life, regarding ourselves, regarding our work with others, and regarding our work with other human beings, and finally, regarding our works in the world itself. Regar regarding ourselves, he says, even though the, the basic service of Torah and mitzvahs starts with the power of God, and by our two parents. How do we, where, where do we start? Our three partners, it says. Father and mother and our third partner, which is God. Um, and the, our early stages, what are we getting? We're getting input. We, we, as a little child, we have nothing. Our mom and, and, you know, sings to us. It used to be the custom of, of Jewish mothers. They would sing to their little babies tunes that speak about the beauty of the Torah. And insp inspirational music like that. It put in moral, ethical, and spiritual ideas into the mind and heart of the child. Father, mother, they educate, they teach, and the like. But, uh, but as we said earlier, eventually you have to stand on your own feet. So what does that mean? Even though in the, in the, in the earlier stages of a person studying Torah, you study from your parents, you study from your educators, from the schools you go to, from the teachers you meet. But at a certain point, a person has to be able to study Torah on their own. That's a very important idea. Especially today's days. It used to be that you know you can outgrow, you can outgrow your teacher. How can you outgrow your teacher? Because you had a teacher who lived in your town. He had a certain amount of information. If you were a bright kid and you learned by the teacher and you kind of already downloaded everything the teacher has to teach, you had no choice but to start studying on your own. <coughs> Today's day, since we have the internet, you can find yourself teachers <laughs> from across the world. Thank God, the teachers are supposed to put the stuff out there. But sometimes it can create a certain laziness where a person says, I don't want to plug my own mind and stand. I can might as well just sit back, relax. You know, have a have a cup of have a have a bottle of kombucha, and sit there and listen to the listen to the all the instructions online. And if this teacher gets boring, I can click on another challenge a, ch a channel and get her. Now that's a good thing. You should always find yourself higher teachers, but at the same time, practice studying on your own. Learn. You'll find you you yourself can innovate. You can study. You can extract. We were learning it earlier that a person is in the last talk. That in order to open up for the new Torah of Mashiach, we need to stimulate innovation. So we should all innovate. So much so that the Torah knowledge that you take in has to become ingrained in your mind and in your memory. That's another thing. We learn. The information goes into our head. But a lot of times, that once the class is over and the teacher pulls away, nothing is there. Maybe vaguely. But you're not because you didn't study it. You have to study it a couple of times until it becomes embedded in your mind. That even after the teacher leaves and you're alone, even a week later, a month later, a year later, you can still pull it up in your memory because it's been deeply engraved. It's there. It became part of you. That's the idea. Sages even say that when it comes to Torah, the objective is that the Torah should become yours. Torah becomes ours, which means the Torah is initially God's. Then God wants it to become ours. What does that mean? That we ourselves can innovate into Torah. In general, the Rebbe says, that's the way it is with God, with the Jewish people as a whole, historically. Initially, when God gave the Torah, he was the one who taught Torah. He came, he, he, he sat with Moses, with Moshe, and he downloaded the Torah to Moshe. Moshe taught us the Torah. But then, even though God is the transmitter of the Torah, God gave it to us, so much so that he wants us to become so identified with it that we become the masters of the Torah. And that's what the Jewish people have been doing. They've been innovating in Torah. But to such a degree does it become ours that when, when, when there is a question arising regarding a certain Torah, Torah decision, a Torah, a law of the Torah, how the Torah would apply to this situation, God himself says, I can't decide that. Let's go down to the, to the, to the, to the courts below, to the Torah courts below, and find out from humans how they how they interpret the law and what their and what their and what their conclusion is. That means that we become the owners of the Torah. 
That's what Hashem wants. So much so that the sages tell a story that one time there was a a a, a rabbinical debate. And some rabbi said regarding a certain Torah law that it's like this, it's pure. It was a question regarding an oven. If it's pure or it's impure, and the stage is debated, and it's becoming a very intense debate. And then a heavenly voice came down, which basically said that God was saying that the law is like this this rabbi is correct. So it was a, the Rebbe Yezer was correct. The sages disregarded. <laughs> Imagine when you hear a heavenly voice, it's pretty serious. I never heard a heavenly voice. They heard it, and 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 they decide and they and they said, "Well, it's nice that that's God's opinion, <laughs> but the way we see it in our minds, the majority down here doesn't see it that way." And they decided to ignore what God said, and they and they based it on what God Himself instructed. God gave us the rules of how to learn Torah, and the rules are that Torah is not in the heaven. God transmitted the Torah from heaven to earth. It's not in the heavens anymore. We are the jurisdiction over the Torah. So the rabbis below ignored the thing. And then they, someone, one of them met Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu, and they asked him, what did God do when, the, when he heard that the people decided to completely disregard his opinion and they, and they, and they finalized the law Based on the majority of the rabbis, what was God doing? Was he throwing a fit? What was God? Was he angry? Did he slam on the table? How dare! And Eliyahu and Avi said God was was smiling from ear to ear, and he was shaking his head and he said, "My children, you won. My children, you won. You were victorious over me." And that's the desire. God wants the Torah to become so much ours. Now. So this is in regards to us and our teachers. That what we receive, our teachers are transmitting. Hashem is part of our teachers, our teachers. Everybody is transmitting, but at a certain point, our, we have to open up our own heads and our own understanding and absorb that knowledge until we can, it becomes part of our, 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 our wisdom. It's our intelligence and we can innovate in it. Fine. In addition to that, the Rebbe says, regarding our own study within ourselves, how do you have the candle rising on its own? Already when you're learning on your own, you're already, you've graduated your teachers. Now you can sit and study on your own. But even over here, it has to be in a way where you're studying on your own. What does that mean? There's, whenever you're learning something new, there is new information coming into our head. And the way it works is that the, the information is there for a while. And then we forget. If you ask me a question regarding something that I learned three years ago, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to take out the book again, whichever book it is, and go and, 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 and reference it and re re learn it again. Maybe it won't be as difficult as the first time because I remember it but I vaguely, but I got to re re rehash it. I got to re. It says that means that you still need a source to bring this wisdom in your head. You need to now, you, re you need to reconnect, you need to re, um, re access your teacher, whether the teacher is, is a person or the teacher is a book. But you need to go to the book and you need to then reread it again. It says that's that's still lacking in this idea that the fire has to be on its own. It says you got to learn something, even if it means learning it a hundred times. You study it and 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 study it until you become so much part of in you that it will never leave. And therefore, the moment the question comes up, you pop it right out of your mind. You don't need any book. You don't need to look it up on Google. You don't have to find it anywhere. It has become etched in your mind. Obviously, this is requiring people that have big memory storage. But you know what? Even average heads, if you work diligently and hard, we can do that. So that, But we can't be lazy. That's the point. You got to learn and learn and learn. And that's the point. It, it, it rises on its own from within yourself. You don't have to consult any 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 origin, whatever, any teacher, even within yourself to teach you, because you are ready from within wherever you are, you already know it all. Not all, obviously, there's always going to be more, but whatever we know has to become so much ours that it's that it's that it's rising on its own. The same is also when it comes to mitzvah observance. This is really, really, really beautiful. So naturally, we have a body, 
And our body is not programmed according to the Torah. Our body is, the, the verse says, a person is born a wild donkey. That means the body wants to be all over the place. The body doesn't is not seeking to comp, to work in a certain. Right? The body is looking for pleasure everywhere. It's looking for and it wants to be wild. It wants to be uncontrolled. Then comes Torah ethics and Torah morality and restrains the body, and also gives us mitzvahs, godly activities and actions for the body to do. So there is a certain period of time where there is something outside the body that is programming the body. You're implementing it onto the body. And it's almost like a trainer training training a dog or training any animal. So our body is also an animal to train it. But the Rebbe says that's not the objective, that there should always be a spiritual force controlling your body. The ultimate state where we need to bring ourselves is that our body should be so broken into. It should get, it have, we have so trained it so well that now the body on its own is running according to Torah and Mitzvahs. The body kind of can be left on and without mindfulness. Your body is actually already programmed in accordance to God's will. That means the lamp is going on its own regarding Mitzvah observance. Your hands and feet intrinsically know, and when it's time to wake up, go to shul and daven and do a Mitzvah. The sages actually say, one of the sages say we have to thank our our knees that it 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 um, unconsciously knows what to do because when we're praying sometimes we space out when we when, it, during the prayer service you're supposed to stand and pray in front of God so those who are new to prayer or to Jewish prayer I envy them why because you're very mindful of what you're saying. Every word is meaningful. But if you're praying from when you're three years old, five years old, six, and you, you, and you just say these words every single day, three times a day, what happens is it starts becoming part of your just, it gets, it gets done by rote. It gets done without any, 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 any thinking. So much so that we go through the motions automatically. That means my body, and so is almost every person who's been praying all their life, Jewish prayer, at a certain point of the prayer, you go like this. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm banging the microphone. You bang your chest, which is when you're asking for forgiveness. It could be you're thinking about who knows what, your mind is completely spaced, and then automatically because you're saying those words, and then your body, there's a certain parts that you kneel. We bow down. So the kneeling happens without thinking. So the Talmud is saying it, not in a complimentary way. The Talmud is saying it, how pathetic it is, that we can be so, that, that a person can be so disconnected to, to prayer that their body is running on autopilot. <laughs> it's not good. But the Rebbe is actually taking that very idea and the Rebbe is revealing the, the, the positive element of that. The positive element of that is that your body has become holy. Your body is already programmed with the divine program. So it automatically, without needing to steer it, you don't have to steer the steering wheel. The body on its own is self-driving. It's driving and holiness. Now, the downside of that is that that becomes rote. You're not in a relationship with God. You're not thinking about God. So the Rebbe says, no, no, no. You train your body to be compliant with mitzvahs. And regarding the mindfulness, for that you have the idea of Ola. You continuously add new things and new things and new things. And in these new things, you have to add your mindfulness while you're doing it. But whatever you've already integrated and gotten your body used to is a very positive thing. And that's ultimately the objective. Because the, what God wants is that the physical world and the physical body should become saturated with holiness till it becomes in, in, um, what is the word? Inex, what's the right word? Inextricable. You can't, ex, you can't, you can't separate it from holiness. Imagine if the same process of, of, uh, of prayer, which almost everybody gets programmed into anybody that is, been in the program for a while it becomes natural to us imagine um what um if that can happen with all the 613 commandments that our body is so programmed in keeping shabbos because we know the laws inside out that we almost can consult our our body um more than our mind 
You know, whatever happens, I, it happens to me many times, you know, where you can see something like that. There are certain things that you have motor, motor memory. I think they call it motor memory, where your body knows and your head doesn't know. So I have a combination at my house. <laughs> there are times I come there and I've gone, <laughs> I've gone through 20 years. And for whatever reason, I'm sitting there, I start thinking, what's the combination? I don't know which numbers to push. And I know that that's the problem because my head got involved. I don't remember. I don't know. I'm better off when I'm not thinking and my fingers automatically go in and punch the combination. So that means that it became part of my, it's It's motor memory. And that's what the Rebbe is talking about. You have to take all the Torah and the mitzvahs and turn it into motor memory. The body is trained to do the God, to live in accordance to God's will. That's completely opposite of our natures of our body. Our bodies in, in the original form before we do the work, before we do the work, our, our bodies are not programmed to anything holy, godly. Now we have to take the divine program through mitzvahs and implement it into our bodies until it becomes a flame on its own, which means without the soul constantly steering the body through our mind in to do the godly thing, our bodies start living naturally the godly way and is what we might call second nature. So it becomes natural. However, now here comes the next idea. Oh, wait, and, 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 and by the way, hold it. The Rebbe says, but it's not only in mitzvahs. It's even in the next stage, which is, as we spoke earlier, that in addition to mitzvah observance, there is the, that everything that we do should be for God's sake, even in our completely mundane areas of life which we're doing to take care of our bodies, all that should be done for, for, with a godly intention. The Rebbe says, even there you shouldn't need mindfulness. Meaning to say that we train ourselves so strongly into serving Hashem that it becomes impossible for us to do something without a, a, a when it's not in the divine interest. It becomes, it becomes naturally, to it's the natural inkling of the body not to move unless there is some divine. It says so it was by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by our forefathers. Their bodies would not move unless there was, a, there was divine, divine intention in what they did. That's why I'll, I'll share with you a very pow powerful teaching. When Abraham um, or came to the, to, the, to the binding of Isaac, so the Torah describes this dramatic moment. Isaac is on the altar and, a and Abraham is, is grabbing the knife. So the verse says, Vayishlach Avram Likachas Amachelas to take the knife, Lishchot as to slaughter, to slit the throat of his son. Okay. It's a very interesting language. He stretched his hand out. It should have said he took the knife. So the simple reason is the Torah is really giving you the drama of it. You know, you've got slow motion. Abraham is stretching out his hand. He's taking that knife. He's picking it up and he's pulling it. But there is a, one of the explanations of why it describes it that way is because Abraham had to make a major superhuman effort to stretch his hand out and take the knife. Why? Not because it was hard for him to do this was because Abraham had trained his body to only do God's will. Naturally, without him thinking, the body was so tuned in to God that the body would could, could only do what God wants. His body became naturally in tune with the will of Hashem. Since God didn't ask Abraham to slaughter his son, he just told him to bring him onto the altar. That's what he told him. Bring him onto the altar. He never said slaughter him. Avram understood it. If I'm putting him on the altar, it means to slaughter him. That's how he understood. It's a sacrifice. That's what you do. So th when he got to this part, the next thing was not God's will. So Abram's hands, his motor, his motor in his body was not complying. But since Abram did think this is God's will, he was overriding his natural instincts of his body. Intuitively, his body was not doing it, but with because he mistakenly in his mind thought he should, he was pushing his hands against their will to take the knife. So this is what we're talking about over here. Bringing ourselves into such, becoming so synchronized with God's will. That's a good word. 
to synchronize ourselves so much with with Torah and with the way the godly life that our bodies naturally all day long are just are just operating with godly intent so this is the service regarding ourselves and then we, the same is also our influence on other people that our influence in other people should also be in a way and when we teach people we have students and we should we should not spoil our students by constantly feeding and feeding and feeding them but at a certain time we have to expect of them and tell them that they got to start you know i'm not gonna you know you got to start learning how to catch fish on your own that's the point your students have to start growing it's that each everybody has to influence each other in that way that we starts becoming fully fully assimilated there are teachers who want to make sure that their students will always be students that's not the way it is according to torah you're teaching in a way that you want your students to become teachers themselves. Now we're just going to conclude the last, the last part for today's lesson, chapter six. The Rebbe says, now, we can go even deeper into this. When we say the body, how long is it already? Oh, we're already one of them. You know what? I'm going to leave this for tomorrow because I don't want to make these classes too long. This will take another 10, 15 minutes. So Be'ez Yosh Hashem, tune back in on Thursday. We're going to learn the next part, and I plan on giving another class on Friday. So with God's help, we can conclude this um, amazing episode before Shabbos. Shabbos, Ba'alos. Meanwhile, let Mashiach come today.